<laughs> Man, y'all sound great worshiping today. Let's, uh, let's pray together this morning. Heavenly Father, we come to you in the precious name of Jesus. Father, we thank you for your presence that's here. But Father, as, you worship, as we worship you, Father, you refill us. So I pray for those that are in this room today who are a little dry, a little worn down, God. I pray that you would renew them today with your presence. God, renew them today with one another. The Father, we may have come limping in here, but I pray that we stand strong walking out, God. The Father, you'd fill us to overflowing. For Father, you have put us into this world to be a salt to this generation, a light on a hill. And so, Father, I just pray this morning and we receive from you all that you have. Spirit of God, we give you permission to go in and work on the inside of us, to do what you need to do to cause us to be transformed into your image. And we thank you, Father, for your goodness and your mercy. In Jesus' name, if you agree with that, say amen. Come on, give God some praise. I tell you, it's a great day here at City Point, great day to worship God. Here we are the very first Sunday of February. In just a minute, at the end of service, we'll receive communion together. But today we also kick off a new series called Thrive. And I've asked our very own Brandon Marshall to share that word with you. He'll be out here in just a minute. So if you could, turn around and say hi to somebody right around you. You can take your seats. Morning, everybody. My name is Andrew, and welcome to City Point. For those of you joining us for the very first time, a great way to learn more about the church is texting WELCOME to 972-460-9235. You'll receive a form from us, and once completed, a team member will reach out and connect with you. Now, as we continue the service, we want to take a minute and bring you up to speed on everything that's happening here at City Point. So check this out. Super exciting news. Starting today, you can sign up to join a community group. Just head over to citypointchurch.com slash groups and click on the group directory to see all that's available. Our spring semester doesn't start until Sunday, February 20th, so you have plenty of time to look at your schedule to see which one you could be a part of. Now let's say you need a bit more information about our group. Sure, you can head to citypointchurch.com slash groups or, or hear me out, you can huddle up with one of our group leaders next week during Big Game Sunday. Not only do you get to rep your favorite team jersey, eat some good game day snacks, you also have the opportunity to chat with one of our community group leaders. They'll be available out on the lawn to help answer any questions you have and get you signed up for the best group fit for you. Don't miss out. Bring your jersey and get in the game by joining a group next Sunday, February 13th. Do you want to be the very best? Like no one ever was? Well, you got to catch Super Sunday on February 20th. In all our classrooms, your kiddos will have a fun time with games, goodies, and take some sweet photos with some of their favorite Pokemon. Now look, is Pikachu in the Bible? No, absolutely not. But I'm sure you have a friend or a neighbor whose kids love Pokemon, and this is a great opportunity to invite them to experience what it's like to be a part of a life-giving church. After all, we love making it easy for you to invite your friends to City Point. Save the date, invite someone, and we'll see King you there. Hey ladies, we are so excited to invite you to our sisterhood pop-up happening on Monday, February 21st from 5.45 to 8 p.m. Join us as we skate the night away at Thunderbird Roller Rink in Plano. The cost is just $20, which covers fun games, food, prizes, and lots of skating. Every sisterhood event is different and something you won't want to miss. So text your girlfriends and register today at citypointchurch.com sisterhood. 
you have a 100% chance of success in marriage. You just need to do it God's way. A strong marriage rarely has two strong people at the same time, but it's often a husband and wife who take turns being strong for each other in the moments the other is weak, and then together realizing that it's Jesus who's holding you. May the God of hope fill you all with joy and peace as you hold hands with one another. And that's all that's happening here at City Point. If you missed something or if you got some more questions, feel free to talk to our team at the info desk or email us at info at citypointchurch.com. Now, let's welcome Brandon Marshall to the stage as he kicks off a brand new series this month called Thrive. coffee or what? Everybody good? Great to see everybody. Those of you who are joining us online, we want to say welcome to you. And those of you who are here for the first time, thank you for coming. And uh, I will say, please come back. Do not judge this church by what you hear here today. You've already met Pastor Eddie. And uh, please come back and allow him a chance to minister to you. But we are so, so excited to be here. I guess everybody survived the snow apocalypse of 2022 already, huh? So I was in uh, Florida through the whole thing. I know. <laughs> I know. And uh, so I was calling my wife, and bless her heart, she was home with the kids, and she's like, these kids are driving me nuts. And I'm like, yeah, uh, all right, babe, I'll call you back. I got to get to the beach. So it was, uh, I know, uh, it was terrible. Uh, anyway, so uh, it's great to, great to have you here. How many of you are excited about this new series called Thrive? Yeah, 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 me too. Uh, there are, so our verses uh, for, our launching pad verses for, uh, for this series come out of uh, the book of Psalms, chapter chapter 92, which uh, the entire chapter is wonderful, by the way. If you get a chance to read it, so, so much truth. Uh, the whole book, of course, the whole Bible, but, uh, but Psalm 92, for some reason, is, is very, very special, so I encourage you to read that, but we're going to start with verse 12, and it says this, the righteous thrive like a palm tree and grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Planted in the house of the Lord, they thrive in the courtyards of their God. They will still bear fruit in old age, which, by the way, the older I get, the more I appreciate that verse. I look in the mirror, and I'm like, you're still going to bear fruit, bro. Just hang in there. It's all good. Healthy and green. To declare this, that the Lord is just. He is my rock, and there is no unrighteousness in him. Father, thank you for the truth of your word. Thank you, Lord, for those who have made it here today, Lord, and those who are watching online. I thank you, Lord, that your word does what I cannot that as your word goes forth, Lord, it works on the hearts of the listeners, that it bears fruit in our life, Lord, healthy and green. Thank you, Lord, that you watch over your word to see it performed, that no word returns to you void, Lord, but it will accomplish what it was meant to do, that it will flourish in the lives of your people, and as a result, our lives will flourish. We thank you for your goodness and your mercy and your grace and all good things. In Jesus' name. Amen. So this series is interesting. I think uh, the word thrive, and those of you who know me for about 15 minutes or even more, uh, know that I love words. I, I, I love words. I don't know how to communicate well with my face, uh, which is uh, funny because sometimes during Zoom calls, uh, I'll just turn the camera off because I know my face is communicating something that I would never want anybody to know. Uh, you know, I, I love the Word. I love the Word of God, and I love words in general. So I, I actually looked up the definition of this word, thrive. Are you ready? The word is, the original text is parak. Parak. That's how you say it. Say it with me. Try it. Parak. Well, you'll, you'll get it. Uh, it. The word means this, to spring forth, to break out to shoot up, and one, one version of it is to make fly or to soar. How many of you would love for your life to just take off, right? How many of you have been in a season before where you feel like nothing was happening and then all of a sudden God intervened and it was like you just leveled up? We want to continue to level up. In fact, that's God's will for our life. It isn't just so that we can survive here on earth. He cares so much about the things of our life that he wants every area of our life to thrive. In fact, the Bible teaches us that the, the thief came to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus said, I came that you could have life and have it more abundantly, a life beyond what you can imagine, a life that is, it is higher, bigger, stronger than it is now. 
And so God is always progressing these things in our life. So I'm very excited about this series. Uh, the book of Psalms, again, is such a wonderful, wonderful book. It, it talks about us being blessed and us thriving and all these things, no matter what the season is. Uh, I just delivered a message uh, in Florida uh, not too long ago that um, actually last week. Um, that, uh, that I, I came up with uh, talking about crossing over, and someday I'll share it with you, but it talks about the seasons of life and how in some seasons we feel stuck and some other seasons our lives are good, and, and, but there's these seasons that are in between. And people thought, you know, as a, as a motivational speaker and a public speaker on, on some level, people, can, people always ask me, how do you come up with some of the stuff that you, that you do? We constantly have to be pouring into ourselves so that we'll have something to offer. Otherwise, I just repeat myself, and I, I, I'm tired of hearing myself sometimes. So I gotta be uh, getting fresh information, and, and you'd be surprised at some of the things that inspire us. For instance, if I said to you, now the law is as old as the jungle, and the river runs over and back. For the strength of the pack is the wolf, the strength of the wolf is the pack. Some people go, man, that's deep. Other people are like, man, that's Jungle Book. No, 100%, that's Jungle Book, yeah. Inspiration comes from other, all over the place. It's Toy Story, baby. You just weren't paying attention, right? I mean, I have to gather these information. So uh, I, was, I was walking through the living room the other day, and my son, who's four, we have three children, 17, 10, and four. Uh, my 17-year-old is a great kid. Uh, he'll be 17 in a week or so, but he feels like he's 22. Anybody got that kid in your house? And then my daughter, who's 10, she's here on the front row, so I'll be cautious. Um, she's, uh, <laughs> she's not only the only girl, but she's also the middle child, so all prayers are welcome. And, uh, and then we have a four-year-old who you've met named Lincoln. And Lincoln uh, is the little bald-headed one, not because there's anything wrong with him, because he won't quit cutting his own hair. Uh, this is the third time, and there's just no other choice. You just got to skin it. I think he's getting used to people rubbing on him, so I think he kind of enjoys it. But he's, so he's watching this program. It's, uh, it's uh, on Discovery Channel where they show the earth and the different animals and the creatures. You know, it's a very interesting story. And I'm walking by, and I hear this. Oh, the caterpillar. It's uncanny, right? I mean, of all of nature's creations, perhaps this one possesses the most potential for change. I sound just like that, brother, don't I? <laughs> I'm watching this, and all of a sudden it shows this caterpillar going to a different season, a different stage. And we all know how this works, that the caterpillar goes into a cocoon and it forms uh, a chrysalis around itself and then it becomes eventually a butterfly. And so we watch this metamorphosis take place. But I, I, uh, I thought to myself as I was watching that, what happens if in the middle the caterpillar just goes, nah, no, that's too much. This is where it all ends for me. I, I, don't, I don't care. I'm just, a, you know, because it's a painful process. And sometimes growth happens in a painful way. So when the Bible talks about our lives thriving, God doesn't promise that it will be without challenge, that it will be without stretching, that it will be without pain or any of those things. All he promises is that it will, that, that it will happen, that if we'll hold on and see it through to the end, it will happen. And seasons of life work very, very strangely sometimes. Uh, we get stuck in the middle because we're, we're losing. We feel like we're losing something that was, hoping to gain something that will be, but we're in the middle. We don't have a firm grasp on either one, and we're kind of in this very vulnerable state called the in-between or the transition period of life. And so it's in these moments that we must be so connected with God and more convinced of his love and his presence in our life so that we can see the end. It's not enough just to be a great caterpillar. I'm sure some of them went... I have to do that? No, it's fine. I'll just crawl around and eat leaves. I don't, I don't want the whole thing, right? But it's, it's a process that happens. I grew eight and a half inches, eight and a half inches in height between eighth grade and ninth grade. The summer between eighth grade and ninth grade, I grew eight, eight and a half inches. And I would wake up in the middle of the summer, and I mean, my legs would be just hurting, and I'd be screaming. My brother, who we, I shared a room with, would come over there and start beating on my legs and trying to stretch me out and all this different stuff. My back hurt. All this stuff hurt. It's called growing pains. It happens. It's all part of the process. Growth happens, and, and there's a certain amount of dis discomfort that comes with thriving. There's a certain amount of, of, of vulnerability and, and strangeness in between these seasons, and God promises us that he will be with us in those seasons. But the end result is that you're going to be better, stronger, more excellent than you were before. So we have to keep our mind focused on what's coming to be able to endure what is. You understand? I want to read to you the story today about a gentleman named Samuel. Now, Samuel uh, was established as a prophet in the Old Testament. And, and uh, back in those days, the prophet was the one who carried the word of the Lord. Very powerful people, very well-respected people. But it hadn't always been that way in his life. In fact, Samuel came from a person who could not even have children. The fact that he was even alive was a miracle. 
It tells a story about a lady named Hannah, and Hannah was the second wife of a gentleman uh, who, um, who loved her dearly. He loved her beyond what she could do. And back in those days, ladies, I, I know you're glad you live in, in this century, but back in those days, a woman's worth to her husband, her family, to the world was in bearing children and what they could do, right? This is how it was, and she could have none. And yet the counterpart, his other wife, was just, I mean, a baby-making factory, just spitting them out. And she took every opportunity she could to rub it in Hannah's face that she was barren and she had no children. Every chance that she got to remind Hannah of her worthlessness, she did. And every year they would go up and they would offer their sacrifice at the temple. They would, they would go and visit the priest. And every year Hannah got more and more depressed until one day she walked down onto the steps of the church and she sat down and she started talking to God. Now the Bible teaches us that she was groaning from within, that there was this deep pain and I don't know if you've ever been in a position where this pain has become so evident in your life that it's an inward groaning and you don't know exactly what to do or how to express it. And so she was saying things to God. Her mouth was moving, but nothing was coming out. The priest at the time was a gentleman named Eli. And Eli came out and observed this happening and thought that Hannah was drunk. And he said, how long will you be drunk? You need to go and sleep it off. And she said, no, that's not what's happening at all. That I'm asking the Lord for a child to give me some kind of worth. I'm worthless and I'm asking him desperately for a child. And Eli said something very powerful to her. He said, go your way and may God grant you everything that you ask. Something happens when the word of the Lord goes forth from the representative. That word that went forth from Eli over her life bared fruit. And the Bible says that the Lord remembered Hannah. Some of the most powerful scriptures in the, all, of the, all, the, uh, all of the Bible, some of the most powerful moments that we will ever see, the Bible says that God remembered. When Samson was, was between two stones and he had sinned, he had done all these things and his life was pretty much over with that he, he placed his hands on the pillars that held up the whole city and he prayed, Lord, remember me. And the Bible says that the Lord remembered Samson. There was a thief on the cross next to Jesus. He was crucified between two people who deserved to die even though he himself did not. One of the thieves said what? Lord, when you enter into your kingdom, remember me. Now, Jesus didn't say, yeah, well, it's too late, buddy. You spent your whole life doing wrong and now you want to turn to me? Of course you would. Jesus didn't say any of that. What did he say? Today you'll be with me because God is a God who remembers. The Bible says that God remembered Hannah and she bore a son she called his name Samuel because God had heard her prayer. She said, if you'll give me a son, I will give him back to you all the days of his life. And this is how we see when we have the children dedicated in the house of God, when we bring our children here and we dedicate them to God, this is where this came from, that we are saying that God knows better to what to do with our children, that we're so grateful for them, that we know that he loves them much more than we do, and we dedicate our children to God. I will point out to you that the Bible says that when she weaned him, that she took him back. She did exactly what she, she said she would do. When she dedicated him, she brought him to the house of God where the man of God was. It's a good time to point out that things that are dedicated to God are dedicated in the house of God. That everything that we dedicate has, has a place. Whatever we dedicate our lives to has a place. Dedication to a diet begins in Subway with six grams of fat with a six inch sub. Don't get the mayonnaise and the cheese and you'll be all right, right? Dedication to fitness is in the gym or your home gym or wherever it is. Dedication to a life of learning is in the books. It's in the, the, the processes. It's in all these things. There's a dedication. If there's a dedication, there's a place for that dedication. But you will never in your life walk into the subway and see someone holding up a baby going, Lord, we'll give this baby to you. <laughs> Toasted, please. Yes, tomatoes. It doesn't happen. Because things that are dedicated have a place to be dedicated. And Hannah understood this, that if I'm going to dedicate anything to God, it'll be dedicated to the house of God. Yeah. And so Samuel starts his journey as a young boy, and every year his mom would make him a new coat, and she would come and see him. Can you imagine after not having children, <laughs> after not being able to bear children and being looked down on and all that, you finally, God answers your prayer, and you got to give him away. Why? Because that's what you said you would do. And I think that there's something powerful that happens in Samuel's life as a result of his mother being dedicated. I think that thriving starts with those that are with us, that dedicate us, that, we, that, 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 that 
things that happen in our lives. You should be grateful for your parents bringing you to church. And I know that the children are over there and I would shout loud enough for them to hear them, but there's something happening when we bring our children to church and allow them to grow and allow them to experience these things. We are doing something that is setting them up for the future. It's not just a place where they can go while we learn. They're learning too and they're growing and the things that are establishing now, some of the greatest relationships I have in my whole life, I, I developed in the house of God as a young person. And I know I've talked, I've talked to you about the weirdness of the churches I grew up in. I've talked to you about the strangest things that happened. But the truth is that there are times in my life that I can look back on, that I lean on the things that I learned even at a young age. This dedication. Our lives begin to flourish when a dedication happens. Our lives begin to thrive because we dedicate something to God, because we, we give something to him. We give our life to him. And so Samuel's life began thriving at that age. The Bible says that he started serving Eli the priest. And we'll pick up the story in chapter 3. Chapter 3, verse 1 describes this. And I'll, I will, uh, I'll read to you uh, the rest of the chapter. But for this, I'll, I'll just describe it to you. The Bible says that there was a, they were living in a time where the word of God was not heard. There was no widespread revelation. Nobody was having any visions. God wasn't saying anything. And if you can imagine being in some of the tumultuous times that we've been in the last few years or several years or months or whatever it is, and not having the word of God to lean on, not having any kind of direction, because they didn't have the Bible. We have the Bible. They didn't have the Bible. All they had was whatever God was saying then. And when God was saying nothing, they had nothing. All they had was memories and thoughts of what he used to be, and there was, he wasn't saying anything. There was no vision. And the, 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 the Bible says that the, Eli, the priest, in this moment, his eyes were growing dim, so he's getting older. He's becoming less effective at what he's doing as a result of no revelation. And so it kind of paints this dark picture, this dark scene. And the Bible says that the, they were in the temple where they lived, and the, the light of the temple even was starting to go out. So everything is dim and dark, desperate. And it's in this moment that God called Samuel. I wonder how many people in this room is God trying to reach and give a new destiny to in these times. And whatever moment we're in and it seems dark and hopeless and all those things, I'm grateful that we have God that's with us always. I'm grateful that we have the word of God at our disposal. But make no mistake about it, that God is still calling people to a higher purpose. That he's still trying to reach you. Yeah. Well, what can I do? We think, well, what, what, do, what can I do? What do I have to offer? You're thinking on your own natural ability to think about who you are. You're, you're, you're looking at yourself from a very natural perspective when God is looking at you from a perspective of someone uh, of a season that you have yet to go into. Huh. David was anointed king in front of all of his brothers. And they had tried to pour the oil over all the other brothers and the oil didn't pour until it got to David and then it poured it did what it was supposed to do teaching us this very valuable truth that the anointing knows the us that we don't know yet David had no idea what it was like to be king he had no idea even what was going on all he knows is he was showing up and there's people pouring stuff on him he don't know what it means but the oil knew because God knows the you that you don't know yet and in a dark season, if God is speaking your name, it's because he has a destiny for you to walk into that he has yet to reveal to you. But if you'll just trust him and say, yeah, I'm right here. Let's see what happens. Chapter 3. Ah. Verse 3, it says, The lamp of God had not yet gone out in the temple, and Samuel was lying down in the house of the Lord, where the ark of God was. Now, I'll stop right there for my first point. The Ark of God, or the Ark of the Covenant, is in the Old Testament where the presence of God dwelt. And back then, there was no, that we didn't know God like we know him now. We don't know the grace of our Lord Jesus and all that. God was very powerful, very scary, very frightening to people that had no understanding of who he was. This Ark held the presence of God. There were people who made the mistake of touching it when they shouldn't have. And they would fall dead. Yeah, scary stuff. Somebody made the mistake of stealing it. And they put it in their camp, and then all this stuff started happening, and they were like, uh, y'all need to come get this, because we didn't know what we were doing, and like, we're real sorry, can y'all come pick up your ark? <laughs> and yet Samuel, the Bible teaches us, in the house of God, where the ark of God was, is lying down. I think the first key to our life thriving is this. 
is that we become, pre- we become comfortable in the presence of God. We become comfortable around him and who he is and all of his grace and his mercy and all these things. And what keeps us from becoming comfortable with God's presence is because we know our dirt. We know the mistake that we just made and what's the last thing that we want to do. Oh, Lord, I don't know. we can't talk right now. You saw what I just did. I'm the, no, 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 that's the opposite of who God is. God is the first person you should run to with a mistake. He's the one that we should come to with a mistake, but our natural reaction is to shy away. Shy away to his goodness because we don't feel like we deserve it. The Bible says that Jesus was standing on the shore and he talked to Peter the first time that they, it was one of the first encounters they had. He said, launch out and let's go catch some fish. And they're like, we're putting the nets up, man. We ain't caught anything all day long. We're, 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 this is over. We, we fished all day. And by the way, we're fishermen. We know how to get it done. And it didn't work. And Jesus said, well, let's try it anyway. Peter said, all right. At your word, we'll go. And they got out there and Jesus said, throw your nets over to this side. And they started catching so many fish that the boat was sinking. Now, I would like to experience that just once. <laughs> I tell my buddies all the time, we take a guide. I'm like, every time we take a fishing guide, the, the same thing happens. He looks at us and goes, I don't know what happened. We were killing them yesterday. Every time. Just one time, Jesus. Just one time. Let's just sink this sucker. Let's just get this. Let's just. Yeah. It starts happening. This goodness and this, this show of who God is and the strength of who Jesus is and his grace and his abundance and all this. And Peter said, depart from me. I'm an evil man. I don't deserve to be around you. I our natural reaction is to push him away and go, you're too good for me. Your goodness is too much for me. And so we hide ourselves away from him when we should be attaching ourselves to him. If our lives are going to thrive, we have to become pre- comfortable with the presence of God in our life. And allow his grace and his mercy to work in us in ways that we don't even understand. Open your life up to who he is and allow allow him to take away those walls and those barriers. Are you going to make mistakes? Yeah, sure. Welcome to the human race. You did it today. You're probably going to do it tomorrow. But you know what? He's going to be there both times. He's not walking away. And the Bible teaches us that it's his grace that teaches us to live above those things. To put aside those things. And so if we're not accepting of his grace and who he is, and if we don't allow him the opportunity, then those are things that we're going to continue to hold on to and walk away from. We have to be okay with being exposed to him because he knows all of it anyway. Get comfortable with the presence of God. So Samuel is lying down next to the ark around the presence of God in this very dark scene. And the Bible says this in verse uh, 3 and 4. I'm sorry, 4 and 5. It says, Then the Lord called Samuel. Samuel said, here I am, and he ran into Eli. In that moment, God calls Samuel. In this quietness, in this presence, in this this moment, he says, Samuel, Samuel. What did Samuel do? He said, that must be Eli. And he runs into the priest, and he says, "Uh, you called me? Eli's like, no, boy, I, I didn't call you. He calls him son, so they, now they've developed this relationship. No, son, I didn't call you. Go back and lay down again. So Samuel goes back and lay down again, and the Bible says that the Lord spoke to Samuel. He said, Samuel, Samuel, Eli. And he runs in there to Eli. He's like, uh, you, did you call me? He said, boy, now listen, this is where I would have got a little bit sideways, okay? Because there are two things that I just can't, I don't, I don't handle well, and I'm just going to be open with you as family this morning, okay? I don't like bad drivers. You people... If you're in the room, God bless you, and, and that's all I'll say about that. <clears throat> and I don't like, mm, whew, mm, don't like being woke up, especially suddenly. Anybody agree with me? You get woken up suddenly, and it's like every violent thing that's ever happened in your history comes rushing toward the top of your head. It's so crazy. The things that you can imagine, all within like a split second, like you're thinking, where are the knives? Where are like, this is crazy. You are. I'm not. I'm just saying. My children know now, if you're going to wake up dad, you've got to start at his feet. You'll start at his feet, and you've got to gently touch him all the way up to his shoulder, right? You don't want to get right in his face and go, dad, oh, no, no. They're sworn to secrecy, but they could tell you some stories. I don't like to be woke up. But Eli was very, very gracious. He said, that wasn't me. Samuel, go back and lay down. And this continued to happen until finally he comes in there and he says, look, the Bible says that Eli perceived that God was calling Samuel. Isn't it great to have people in our life that we can trust 
I'm grateful for my relationship with Pastor Eddie and Julie. I'm grateful for, uh, I'm, I'm submitted to them in, in what we do, and I, they are my leadership, and I'm, I'm grateful for those times where they see things that I can't see. When I'm having lunch and I'm pouring my heart out to Eddie, and he goes, no, listen, you're looking at it wrong. I said, I'm grateful for those things, right? You need to have people in your life that you're submitted to. I think thriving, part of a thriving, and I didn't put this in the notes, but part of thriving is having someone in life that we're accountable to. And we think, oh, man, I've worked my whole life to be an adult, so I don't have to be accountable to anybody. You're missing the point. Accountability is not a prison. Accountability is freedom. It gives you a covering. It gives you someone to cover you and to be there for you. It's great to be accountable. I'm accountable to Pastor Eddie. I'm accountable to the people I work for. I'm accountable to my friends and my wife and those people that are in my life, and I love it. I love the accountability factor because if not, then what do I have? Some people get mad when the boss says something to them. I like it. Well, Pastor Eddie, if he ever has to correct me, I love that because I know that at least he cares enough to say something to me. That that correction comes with love. Right? So accountability is not a bad thing. So I think part of thriving in our life is find someone to be accountable to. Find someone that will walk with you and cover you and give you good advice. And so Eli says, it's not me, it's the Lord. I, what I want you to do is go back and lay down. And if you hear that voice again, say, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. So Samuel goes back and lays down. But what I love about that moment is that every time that he called, Samuel jumped up and ran, thinking it was Eli, believing that it was Eli that called him. Now, what he could have done is after the first couple of times said, I'm just hearing things, I'm going to go back to sleep, but he didn't because there was a servant heart in him that required more, that if that is Eli, I must go and I must serve. I think part of thriving in our life, and that's the second point is this, that we serve beyond our own comfort level. I think there's some things in our life that we have to say yes to that aren't necessarily convenient. Even when we're too tired, even when it doesn't make sense, even if it doesn't fit our agenda that we are willing to serve. I can promise you this, that my life wouldn't be where it is today and I wouldn't be able to enjoy the things that I do and enjoy these opportunities had I not said yes to some things that didn't quite fit where I was going. I, uh, Sarah and I were, were uh, in church. It's been uh, a long time ago. We, we were just married. <clears throat> I mean, barely married, and I was barely saved. Uh, I was saved, but not, re- I mean, like, pray with me, don't play with me. You know what I mean? <laughs> and uh, and uh, we were at church and, and, and just enjoying sort of what was going on and enjoying being in the house of God. And a lady that I didn't know came up to me. She was the pastor's daughter who led the children's church ministry. And she said, um, we're going to start splitting up the boys and the girls on occasion and teaching them separately because I think there's some things that they can learn. And I'm like, oh, interesting. And she says, I want you to teach the boys. I'm like, you want me? I grew up in a pastor's home, which is why I never wanted to do this. <laughs> and before I knew what I was saying, I said, yes. Yeah, I'll do it. I went home and told Sarah, I said, she goes, you don't need to pray about it? I said, no, I didn't pray about it. I just said, yeah, should I have prayed about it? <laughs> what did I but I did it. There's a, uh, the great theologian, Richard Branson, he's not a theologian, he's a billionaire though. He said this, if someone asks you if you can do something, say yes, and then get busy figuring out how. And so we don't miss the opportunities. And so I said yes, and I started teaching little boys. And I started discovering that the Lord was saying things through me that I didn't know how to say. And then I got an opportunity to preach through the youth group, and I did that, and it went well. And I'm like, oh, my goodness, what a, something's happening here, this discovery process that started a 20-year journey in ministry where I've been almost everything. I've been a youth pastor, associate pastor, men's pastor. I uh, haven't taught the ladies because, let's be honest, I don't know much about y'all. <coughs> <laughs> I've done almost everything. It's been great. It's been wonderful. I had the opportunity to pastor a church for a while full time. And if the Lord ever asked me to, to again, I, I guess I would. <laughs> Hard. Yeah. All the things that I've enjoyed and all of where it's led my career and all that started by saying yes to something that was inconvenient for me. 
saying yes to something I didn't quite understand. When I first started coming here, Sarah and I had been through uh, a lot in that little pr time, in that little process, and we had had, you know, breakups with relationships that we thought we would have forever, and it was a very hurtful time, and I just wanted to get my family somewhere safe. Let's just go to this church called City Point. We've got some friends there, and they tell me it's a place where I can recover and where people will love me. And they were right. I was done. I didn't want to do this again. I sat in the back of the church, and about three or four months in, Pastor Eddie asked me to come to lunch with him, and we sat down, and he said, I want to get you involved. And my brain was going, don't do it. <laughs> but my heart knows that I should. He said, I want you to take over the ushers. I want you to be in charge of the ushers. And I'm like, bro, you're literally asking me to do the one thing I have never done in church. <laughs> You want me to help with the kids? I got you. Youth, I got you. Men's, all these different youth, ushers. Okay, we'll start something new. But I didn't hesitate. I didn't hesitate. Because part of thriving means that we have to serve sometimes in a place where it's inconvenient. That we got to get up and run when our name is called. Yeah. So Samuel goes back and he lays down. The Bible says this, and I'll read it to you because I love it. It's in verse 10. It says, then the Lord came and stood there, calling us other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel said, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. I love that. It says, the Lord came and stood there. Make no mistake about it this time, Samuel. It's not Eli, it's me. I will come and stand next to you. I love it. There's something so special about the presence of God just coming and standing next to you. In fact, the Bible teaches us that, that God commended his own love toward us, that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. While we were messed up and broken without hope and hated him and knew nothing about him and did not need him, that God commended his love toward us. That The literal translation means that God made love come and stand beside us. Oh, what a powerful scripture. And I don't know about you, but I know that I'm grateful. I'm grateful for a love that came and stood beside me, for a love that understood me, that didn't judge me because of the things that I'd done or because of the way I grew up or any of those things. He didn't care about any of that. He, he loved me anyway, and he, he caused my life to flourish because love came and stood by me. What an amazing scripture. The Bible says that the Lord came and stood there and said, Samuel, Samuel. And he said, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. Now, he could have at that point thought Eli was crazy. He could have said, you know what? I'm not going back in there. I'm going to go over here and play Nintendo or something. I can't, even, I can't even sleep anyway. And kind of went and did a different thing, but he was obedient and went back to the place where God was speaking to him. And I think the third thing in our life that causes us to thrive is this, is that we position ourselves to hear the Lord and to respond to his voice. That we put ourselves in a position where he can speak to us and where we can speak to him and where we can have this dialogue. The world is full of distractions. And if you hadn't noticed, there's something that, that happens every day uh, that, that, will, that will distract us. There are things that happen in our life all the time. My leg buzzes sometimes because I think I have my phone in my pocket. I know I'm not the only one. <laughs> Thank you for your confirmation. I'm just making sure. <laughs> Right? There's, there's always these things that are ready to, to take our attention. Our career has our attention. Our children have our attention. Our hopes and our dreams and our aspirations have our attention. The things that we want to be, the disappointments that we are not have our attention. Everything is vying for our attention. It's up to us to set aside the time, whatever it is. And I'm not saying that you need to find a room in your house, but if you need to find a room in your house, then do it. A time and a place where you meet with God, where you give him that few minutes and allow him to position yourself to hear what he's saying. God so desperately wants to call us to something higher and, and put these things in our life and in our heart, a, a word for, for us or for someone else or whatever it is. Take a minute and hear what he's saying. Our prayers are so one-sided one sometimes. And we talk to God when we need something. Say, Lord, all right, Lord, here's my list for today. Appreciate it. See you on the other side. And we're walking off to go to work and he's going, wait, wait, uh, there's something I wanted to tell you. There's something I wanted to share with you, man. Like I thought we had a thing. Something that, something so desperately want to, to share with you that if you'll take a minute and listen, we have to be able to put ourselves in a position. Whatever it costs, there's nothing more important in life than hearing the word of the Lord, than hearing what he is saying and allowing him to guide and direct our life 
Because at the end of the day, he's trying to cause us to thrive, to soar, to break forth, to be more, to have more, to live more than we are now. I don't want to get to heaven and him point out to me all the times that I missed it. (laughs) I don't. And I doubt that that will happen, but I'm sure somewhere there's a list of times where he wanted to do something cool and I was too busy. Take a moment. Listen to what he's saying. And when God speaks, respond. Samuel's life started to flourish in this moment. This is the moment where it all happened. This is the guy who anointed kings. This is the guy who who God used in mighty ways. This guy who came from nothing. This person who God anointed as prophet of God, who, who in a moment where things were not good, God was good in him. A guy that shouldn't have even been there, but he was there because the Lord remembered his mom. If anybody knows what it's like to come from nothing, it's that guy because he came from the impossible. It's in this moment, this encounter that changes his life forever. And I'm believing that one day, if not today, and if you haven't already, and maybe it happens many times, but soon you will have an encounter with God. Some type of, some type of an encounter. An encounter, uh, by definition, means this, a, a collision of two things. And I'm praying for you. In fact, I, I, I speak this over you, that you are going to collide with God in a way that changes the rest of your life. That in the not too distant future, you're going to have an encounter that takes you in a direction that you only dreamed of. A direction that you forgot about years ago, but when you forgot about it, God remembered. That prayer that you prayed that you didn't even believe, that you thought God had overlooked, he's going to answer. God's going to remember you and this encounter moment is coming. And so Samuel says, speak, Lord. Your servant listens. And God starts to tell him things that are, that are not popular. God has a message for Eli through Samuel. (laughs) He says, Eli's sons have been doing wickedness in the house of God. They have forgotten the sacrifice of God and they have made a mockery. And Eli has failed to discipline them. Listen, discipline your children, all right? Parents, discipline your children. Why? Because you love them. That's what the Bible teaches us, that we love our children and we discipline them. And if we who love them don't discipline them, they'll be disciplined by people who don't love them later on in life. You understand? And he said, as a result of their wickedness and Eli's failure to discipline his own children, I'm going to shut this thing down. That they will no longer be involved in the kingdom at all. They will no longer be the priests of God. All this stuff is coming to an end. So Samuel, who has, who, who has served Eli faithfully and who is now in the mix as the son, has to go and deliver this message to Eli. In fact, he tried to avoid him. The Bible says he tried to avoid him. And he was like sneaking around the house. And, oh, there's Eli. I'm not going to go over there. And Eli says, oh, Samuel, Samuel, come here, come here, come here. What did the Lord say? Well, uh, can you imagine <laughs> Samuel, for his own love for Eli, could have made something up, could have said something different, but he didn't. He delivered the word of God. And it was that moment that established him. God knows now I can trust you. Now I know that the word I give you, you will deliver without fail. Hmm. What a tough situation to be in. And yet Samuel did it. And so as a result, the final thing in verse 19, I'll read it to you now. 319 says, and Samuel grew up. And the Lord was with him. Watch this. And he let none of his words fall to the ground. And all of Israel, from Dan to Beersheba. Now, Dan and Beersheba, were they're they're different locations of Israel, right? One is at the bottom and one one is at the top and one's at the bottom. So when you see the Bible, if you ever read from Dan to Beersheba, it means throughout the whole span, a full covering of the country. In other words, everyone in Israel knew that Samuel was established as a prophet of the Lord. And the Lord appeared again in Shiloh. For the Lord revealed himself to Samuel at Shiloh by the word of the Lord. And the word of Samuel came to all of Israel. And the word of Samuel came to all of Israel. This strikes me as interesting. That when he said what God said without fail, that that word became very personal to him. And so I think the fourth thing that causes our life to thrive is this. When we make what God says a personal declaration even if it's inconvenient or it doesn't fit the circumstance. That when we begin to say what God says without fail, then that word becomes personal to us. And I love the Bible says that he loved Samuel, that Samuel started to grow, and God didn't let any of his words hit the ground. 
What a powerful scripture that everything that Samuel delivered accomplished something. Why? Because Samuel was delivering what God had delivered to him. And this is the flow that we have with him, that when we start to take what he says seriously and we start to say what he says and we start to put ourselves in a position where we can hear him and consult him in every moment, then the words that are coming out of our mouth will be what he will say, what he has said, what he has declared. Hmm. I think we go through so many situations in our life that are, that are strange and that are, that are disheartening. And we go through the loss of family members. We go through sickness. We go through all these different things. And it's in those moments that we have to back out and go, Lord, I know the way I feel about this, but what do you got? What do you say? Where, are you, where do you stand on this? When we get a bad report from the doctor or from the bank or from whatever, from work, things aren't going well. We could look at that situation very naturally and respond in a natural manner, or we could back out and say, Lord, I know this is a situation and I know you see it, so, so what are we going to do? Not what am I going to do, what are we going to do? Because your presence is with me. It's not like it was with the Ark of Covenant. Now your presence is with me always, that you live and dwell on the inside of me. I have, readily, I have ready access to your spirit and your wisdom and your knowledge, so what are we going to say about this? And when we start to do that and we start to make God's word a declaration, then, then that word becomes our word. And that's how I can say that the word of Samuel came to all of Israel. Not the word of God. Yeah, the word of God, but the word of Samuel because, God, because Samuel took God's word personally. He started to deliver it as if he was saying what God was saying. God is saying that when you say what I say, it's like I'm saying it. When you declare a thing to be so, it's like I'm saying it. But our language has to match. We gotta be saying the same thing. We gotta be hearing the same thing and declaring the same thing and that only comes through this comfortable presence of God. It only comes through this intimate relationship of taking time to hear him, to hear what he's saying. I love that the Bible says that he communicated to most people by showing up, but to Samuel he communicated through the word. There's a power, there's a power about him communicating in the word. Learn to live a life in the Word. If you can't read it, hear it. If you can't hear it, say it. Get around someone who is saying it and be infiltrated with this Word that changes everything. And when that Word becomes real to you, then it starts to become you. It starts to become your Word. You declare that and you grow and your life will start to thrive. Your life will go higher. The God will make you fly. <laughs> I know it's hard to see right now in this season and in between where it's not familiar, where we feel a little bit vulnerable, but God is with you in this moment and it's in this moment that, that his fingerprint, hmm, his fingerprint is on the shadows of our life. And in those spaces that we can't see clearly, that his voice is there. Would you bow your head? Father, thank you for your word. You, Lord, are magnificent in all of your ways. That you cause our lives to thrive because thriving is who you are. That you are the light in the darkness. That you can light up the darkest days. That your presence can overwhelm and drive out all fear. Can drive out all all sickness. It can drive out all things that oppose who you are. So Lord, help us to become comfortable with your presence. Lord, I thank you for the encounter that's coming for these people here today. A life-changing, thrive-starting encounter with you. Lord, we trust you for it. We love you. We love you for your truth of your word, Lord. Your word declares that you stand over it to see it performed. And then not one word, not one word that you have spoken will return void. It won't come back as nothing. It will accomplish what it was sent to do. But Lord, I thank you that you're no respect of persons. So if you put a power on Samuel's words, then you'll put a power on these words that they won't fall to the ground, but they will take root in the heart of the listener and start to bear that fruit, Lord, no matter the age, no matter how long it's been, or the dormant season that they've been in. Father, I thank you that their lives will thrive, spring up in Jesus' name, that they'll start to come forward and live again. 
In the name of Jesus, I thank you. Thank you, Lord. Now, if you're here today with every head bowed and every eye closed, and you say, I, I, I know about the Lord, and all that sounds wonderful, but I don't have that relationship. I want to start there. I want that relationship with Jesus. I want to know this Jesus who loved me and who gave himself for me and who died so that I could have this everlasting life and this thriving life here on earth. That's the Jesus I want to know. If that's you, then my pastor is about to come and pray a prayer that's going to change the rest of your life. This could be your encounter moment. Thank you, Lord. Pastor, will you come? Amen. I want us all to stand, please. Uh, thank you for that word, Brandon. That was an incredible word from God for us today. Amen. Amen. As Brandon said, um, there's those of you in this room today that maybe you need to take your next step. And maybe your next step is just to begin your relationship with God. Or maybe it's coming back to your faith that you walked away from for whatever reason. Scripture says this to us, that it's simply a confession, that if we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart, that God was raised from the, that Jesus was raised from the dead, we shall be saved. God made it very simple to enter in that relationship with him. And so today what I want to do is I'm going to pray a prayer with everybody in this room. And if you say, hey, Eddie, I want to be included in that prayer. With every head bowed, every eye closed, if you say, that's me, would you include me in that prayer this morning? Can you lift your hand real quick? Because I want to see who I'm praying with today. Amen. That's awesome. Who else? Amen. Amen. All right. Well, let's pray with those that raised their hands this morning. Everybody say this after me. Say, Heavenly Father. I ask that you would forgive me of my sins. I ask you to be the Lord of my life. And I choose to follow you all in my heart from this day forward. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's give God praise for those that made that decision. Come on, you can do better than that. Amen. If you made that decision, you're here in the building with us. In the back of your seat is our next step card. If you grab that, throw it in your pocket, throw it in your purse, and just follow the simple instructions. Just text us uh, the word decision and so we can just celebrate with you. That's all we want to know is just that you made that decision today so we can celebrate. Same with those who are online with us today. Uh, if you prayed with us this morning through the screen, then we want to know that too. There's a couple of things I want to do before we dismiss, and we'll end with worship, uh, and then we'll dismiss after the worship's done. But Scripture teaches us that our our heart towards God is to worship Him with everything that we have. And that means that we take every part of our life and include God in it. And in every part that we say, God, you're first in, is I believe the areas in our life God can bless us in. And so part of that is stewardship of saying, God, I want to worship you with what you blessed me with. Thank you for your goodness, the wisdom in my mind, the breath in my lungs, the strength in my body that allows me to do what I do. And scripture says we come and we worship Him. Proverbs 3, nine says, honor the Lord with your wealth the best part of everything you produce. In fact, 2 Corinthians reminds us that a farmer who plants only a few will get a small crop, but he who plants generously will reap a generous crop. And I want to remind you as we come to this place of giving, this is an extension of our worship just like we began the service with. And so wherever you're at in that place with God, I encourage you right now to just obey God in this area and say, God, I want to honor you with what you've blessed me with. So I'm going to pray over our, our giving today. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to give to worship you with what you blessed us with, God. And I thank you as we do this, as your word promises, that you'll bless what remains in our hands. And Father, what leaves our hands, that you'll also bless. And Father, you'll utilize it to move your kingdom forward. We give you all the glory in, in advance for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, one of the blessings you have when you give at City Point is basically one out of every $10 go to help world missions domestic missions, different things like that. So you may not know that about your giving, but you're really helping more than just a local church. You're helping people all over the world. And if you're giving today uh, and you want to give digitally, in the back of your seat is a QR code, a little black card. You can scan that. Uh, if you're giving cash or check, there's envelopes in the back of your seat, collection boxes on the side of the sound booth that you can give that way. And the very last thing that I want to do this morning is I want us to receive communion together. And the communion element should be in your chair. Um, and if you're sitting on them, they'll be nice and heated now. So um, but this is one of the last things that Jesus did with intention. This was more than just we need to eat. Jesus took this meal and he made it a lesson. And he took something so common, bread and wine, something that these men would touch the rest of their life, probably on a daily basis. And he said in that process, he goes, but whenever you eat this and you break this bread together, 
He goes, I want you to remember not just what I did on this cross, not just a memory of, oh, you know, that's Jesus. But he says, I want you to remember what I've done so that you continue to live out of that perspective. In other words, for those who are hopeless today, he goes, I want you to have hope. I want you to remember what I did on this cross. For those who feel guilty today, he says, I want you to understand that you're forgiven. And so let's take this element of bread. Father, we come to you today holding up this element of bread that represents the body of Christ that was broken for us. And Father, we thank you that, number one, by his stripes we were healed. But Father, he also took the punishment for our sin upon him so that we might be forgiven and free. Next thing scripture says he took was the cup. And he said, this cup represents the new covenant, a promise that I'll never break to you. Those who call on the Lord will be saved. That God will never abandon us or leave us. But he knows our imperfect state, and he accepted us for that. And he said, because of that, I want to do something so that we're always in fellowship. So he made a promise, we'll never break that fellowship. I want to be in relationship with you. That if you ask for that relationship, you can have it. So Father, we thank you today for the blood of Christ that was shed, that washed away our sins, that sealed a brand new covenant and new life for us. Father, we worship you in it now. In Jesus' name, amen.